We're going to take a look at comparative evidence tonight. And really, this is probably the strongest part of this whole kind of study, if you want. Um, you'll see what I mean. Uh, we'll take a look here tonight a little bit at the reliability and comprehension just quickly. And then we'll spend the bulk of our time comparing the King James Bible to the NIV and the New American Standard. Those are the two biggies today. Uh, and then a little bit uh, more on the NIV. And then a short amount of time on the New King James. So that's where we're going to spend our time. Here are some complaints that you'll often get about the King James Bible. Um, at least, you know, these were the ones that I used to throw out when, <laughs> before I believed the King James Bible was God's Word. Ah, who likes those these and those? They're just too difficult. Really? I mean, I don't even have a comment on that one. Like, really? Those are just too hard? And there's actually a reason why God uses thee and thou. And I think I will cover that. Uh, the sentence structure is different. It is. It is. And by the way, for the most part, what it, it makes it stand out. Because it isn't like you talk every day. The, right. You know how you forget the words that you say about ten... Well, I'm dating myself now. I say something, and ten minutes later, I may forget what I said. But the Bible, the way the, word, the sentence is structured, is like it stands out. It, like a big bulb. Archaic words. It's filled with archaic words. No, not really. There's a few archaic words. So learn them. Get a little book that has those, you know archaic words or write them in the back of your Bible. There are a few words that we don't use very often, lasciviousness, um, you know, that prevent is used in a little different way, pre-event as opposed to holding something back, pre-event, prevent means to go before. So there are some things like that. Uh, here's another one, just too difficult to understand. Uh, the King James Bible, I don't understand it, it's too hard. So let's talk a little bit about some of this. I've shown this before. Here's the common claim. The new versions are easier. They're just easier to understand. And I'm just going to read the note that's up there uh, so you can see it. One of the common reasons given for changing the Bible is to make it more readable and easy to understand. Those statements are made by the advertisers, not English majors. The, I, I'm assuming this is still used. If not, it was certainly valid um, recently, and I believe it's still valid, the Flesher Kincaid grade level indicator. It's a proven and unbiased, meaning objective, formula for determining the readability grade level of written material. When they examined chapter 1 of Genesis, the first book of the Old, Test Old Testament, then Malachi, the last book, then Matthew, the first of the new, then Revelation, the last of the new, here's what they found. Just go down the King James line that it required about a 4.4 grade level understanding of scripture. So fourth grade, fifth grade, in between there. And then Malachi 4.6, Matthew 6.7, Revelation 7.5, for an average of 5.8 reading level. Look at the objective report on the NIV. It actually requires an 8.4 grade level reading. Because of Matthew chapter 1, look at that, 16th grade. Okay, And we'll see in a moment what we mean. The NSAB 6.1, the New King James 6.9. So by an objective measure, that statement isn't true, that it's, the other Bibles are just easier. Different King James Bible is different. Again, the sentence structure is different. Few archaic words, admittedly. Okay, that's true. But the comprehension level, and here's, here's what I mean. I'm just going to look at the ones that every other one, just for time's sake. In Ezra chapter 9, verse 5, the King James Bible uses the word heaviness. The New International says abasement. Does that get easier or harder? Does my understanding of English have to get, get you know, a little bit higher grade level? Uh, the next one down, 2 Chronicles, Chronicles 13, 22, you know, the third one down there. Um, King James says story, New International, annotations. Psalm 45, 11. King James says, greatly desired. New International says, enthralled. Nothing wrong with those words, but not easier to understand for somebody who is young and reading. Ephesians 6.4, King James says, provoke. New International says, exasperate. Luke 19.16 says, pound in, in uh, King James. New International says, mina. Luke 23.9, 
King James says, question. New International says, I don't know, how do you pronounce that? Pilled? Piled? I don't even know how you piled, I guess. I'll say piled. I don't know what the word means. I never heard of it before. Um, so, let me read something from the book that I mentioned earlier. Gail Rippinger's book, The Language of the King James Bible. Not that book, but a different book, same author. She wrote this. Research presented in this introduction to this book that she wrote, to the language of the Bible, was prompted by a story of one Christian prisoner's phenomenal leap in reading test scores as a result of reading the King James Bible. He was advised that he was reading at the fifth grade level when he put his name on a long waiting list to enroll in the prison's high school equivalency program. He then began reading the King James Bible daily. Reexamination the next year, one year later, showed that he was now reading at the 17th grade level, postgraduate reading level. How did reading one book, which some falsely claim is difficult, manage to help him rather than frustrate him? That's the beauty of the King James Bible. God lays down line upon line and he teaches you even how to comprehend and read. So, King James compared to the NIV and the New American Standard. Let's take a look at some key verses. Genesis 22.8 says this, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Now notice, I won't read the, the two, I'll just read the NIV because the New American Standard on the right reads essentially the same. Abraham, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son, and the two of them went on together. So at the first blush, it says, well, these look the same to me. No, they're not. First, I want to show you the beauty of what the King James says. It says, God will provide himself. Get it? Is he not the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world? So not only is it beautifully portrayed there, but it's prophetic. That's a verse of prophecy, the way the King James Bible lays it out. It isn't the way the NIV or the New American Standard lays it out. You lose all of that. You miss it completely. The deity of Christ, 1 Timothy 3.16. Watch the King James. And without controversy, well, except in the day and age in which we live. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. See it? Look right next door. Behold, all question, uh, or beyond all question, excuse me, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body. Look at the one next to it. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh. Now, what you've just done here is you've taken the fact that God was manifest in flesh, in the body. And you've just said, he appeared in a body. The first question is, who's he? I said that to a Christian friend of mine who, um, you know, he had a uh, NIV, and he said, well, everybody knows that he is Jesus. I said, no, no, they don't. And the more you keep taking, taking that thing out, you know, here and there, the less they're going to know, but that isn't even the point. There are many unsaved people who believe Jesus appeared in a body. Right. They just don't believe he was God. That's the point. But you see what the King James does? The King James Bible tells you clearly, God appeared in, manifest in the flesh. Very key. Subtle, isn't it? Remember, the serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. Subtle, subtle. God's omnipresence. That means God is everywhere at the same time. You know, God, Jesus can be seated on, or in on earth, but also seated in heaven. Okay, that kind of thing. Watch um, King James from John 3.13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven. Even the Son of Man, now while these words are spoken, where is the Son of Man? He's on earth. Even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. How can that be? Well, he's God and he's omnipresent. But look at what's next to it. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. You lose which is in heaven. 
you lose the omnipresence of God, of Christ in this thing, again, weakening the deity of Jesus Christ. The Godhead, or the Trinity, we often say. 1 John 5, 7-8. Now, if you ask a Christian if they believe in the Trinity, you know, typically they're going to say, yes, the Godhead, the Trinity, yeah. And, and, and what is it? Well, it's the fact that God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one. That's the Godhead. That's the Trinity. Now, if you go looking for that in their Bibles, you won't find it. Right. This verse right here is the only verse in the Bible that says the following. King James. For there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Look at what the New International says. For there are three that testify. The spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three in agreement. That's not the same, is it? And if you look at the NSAB, it says the same thing. And the three are in agreement. The doctrine of the Trinity. Now, I know that you can find in the Bible Jesus saying, I and my Father are one. I know you can find in the Bible that um, the Holy Ghost is called God in the book of Acts. I know you can find in the Bible that while Jesus is being baptized, a dove appears, which is the Holy Spirit, and a voice from the Father in heaven says, this is my beloved Son. I understand that. But that doesn't tell me the three are one, does it? Just, this verse does. This verse does. Taken out of the new Bibles because of what we'll study next week in manuscript evidence. Psalm 138, verse 2. Just hit it briefly. This is God magnifying his words on the left-hand side, underlined. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. If you look at the next two, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Doesn't say one's been magnified above the other. So it's an attack on the scripture, if you will. And same thing in the New American Standard. For you have magnified your word according to all your name. That's not the same as magnified your word above thy name. They're not the same thing. Again, just attacking just a little bit the word of God. We looked at this earlier. The words of the Lord, the King James says, are pure words as silver, tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Now, the NIV and the New American Standard go back to the beginning of this chapter, verses 1 and 2, and they bring that forward and they say, keep us safe and protect from such people forever. And the New American Standard, you will preserve him from this generation forever. Rather than sticking with the antecedent to this, to this term, thou shalt keep them, which is the words of God, it goes back to the beginning of the chapter and say, no, he's going to keep people forever. I don't know which people are going to be kept forever, but that's what it says in an NIV and a New American Standard. Mark 13, 33 in the King James, take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. New International, be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. New American. Take heed, keep on the alert. Notice how, care, how closely it lines up with the NIV. Uh, for you do not know when the appointed time will come. Here's an obvious omission of a reference to pray. Notice it's, it's in a warning given about the importance to pray. Take heed, watch, and pray. So God is warning here about the spiritual deception. He says, take heed, watch, huh, and pray. But, the NIV and the New American Standard remove that. Prayer is part of the armor of God. In Ephesians 6.18 it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplications. Now, Galatians 5.12, King James. I would that they were even cut off, which trouble you. Now if you look at the Bible, you'll see a couple different definitions or usage of the word cut off. It may mean cut off from fellowship, like in Galatians 5.12, or it may mean to be cut off as in your life, in Daniel 9.26, when the Lord was cut off, he was cut off from the land of the living. 
but it never means to castrate yourself or to mutilate yourself. Look at the NIV. As for those agitators, I wish they would go, whole, go the whole way and emasculate themselves. I mean, what is that? The New American Standard. I wish that those who were troubling you would even mutilate themselves. No, I wish they were cut off, out of fellowship, taken out of this, this fellowship. Bad stuff. Now, let's just focus a little bit on the NIV. The NIV removes many words. The Bible says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. The NIV removes 17 verses, 64,000 plus words, and it removes major portions of 147 verses. Let me give you an example. Here it is right here. Matthew 8 and 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you mean? I mean that in the NIV it's not there. The verse is just gone. Whoop, disappeared. But oh, by the way, in their, in their scholarship, they kept the verses the same. So if you looked at the NIV and you looked at the next verse, it would be the same next verse that the King James has, but that shouldn't be because they eliminated a verse. So how do you keep the numbering system the same? But they did. Right. Acts 8.37 And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is gone from the NIV. What's the point? This shows us, this is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in the book of Acts, and the Ethiopian eunuch wants to get baptized. And, and uh, uh, Philip says to him, sure, you can be baptized. Make sure you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ first. It gives the order of, of salvation and then baptism. Not baptism to be saved, salvation and then baptism. Removed from the NIV. It's gone. Whoop, not there. Archaic words. These, these, and thous, and you, all that stuff. King James says, Marvel not, Nicodemus, talking to Nicodemus, the Lord speaking. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The NIV says, ye should not be surprised at my saying, you, sh you must be born again. So now, in the NIV, he's talking to, if, if the Lord uttered the words in the NIV, he's saying to Nicodemus over here, uh, you shouldn't be surprised at me saying, you, you must be born again. Okay, that's all right. But look what the King James says. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Nicodemus, ye must be born again. Ye is a plural word. Thee is a singular word. And that's salvation. The call goes out to ye, to everybody, but thee must respond by faith. You personally. So using those words, it's just beautiful the way God did it. If you want to know the perfection of the English language, you read a King James Bible. I once heard those words uttered by an unsaved linguist on PBS. He said, they were talking about languages, and he said, well, if you want to know uh, when the English hit its perfection, he said, uh, you've got to read the King James Bible. <laughs> he wasn't a saved man. He was just telling you where the, where the language was perfected. The deity of Jesus Christ, again, NIV. You know this verse, great, great verse. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, speaking about now the Lord is going to speak. Um, Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings have been from of old, from everlasting. Jesus Christ, being God, is from everlasting. The NIV says, look at the bottom of it, whose origins are from of old from ancient times. No, the Lord Jesus Christ is from everlasting. Right? I mean, so you can see how it destroys the deity of Christ in Micah 5 too. 
Ephesians 3 verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. How is it created? By Jesus Christ. And, and the NIV says, And to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, uh, which from ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. Again, a little weakening of the deity of Christ. Now, yeah, can you find the deity of Christ in the NIV? Sure you can. You really can. But again, a little chip here, a little chip there, and when you're in a spiritual battle, or a battle for your own life, your own soul, your own spirit, uh, is being tortured, man, you want the perfect word of God. As Warren B. Smith said, the one that really skewered the lies of that new age. That's the one you want. Interesting. We're going to go around like this on the text, up at the upper left-hand corner. Isaiah 14, verse 12, on the left and on the right, and then below it is going to be Revelation 22, 16, on the left and on the right. But we're going to start in the upper left-hand corner, King James. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Okay? Who is he talking about? Class participation. Who are we talking about? Satan. By the way, he has a name, doesn't he? Lucifer. Only in a King James Bible. He has a name. Now, he's called Son of the Morning. Now, we're going to speak of Jesus, the next one. I, Jesus, I am the root of and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So Lucifer is the Son of the Morning. Jesus is the bright morning star. Go over to the right, NIV. I, Jesus, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright morning star. Good. But look up above, upper right-hand corner. NIV. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. No, Jesus is the morning star, not Lucifer. Lucifer is the son of the morning. You see what it just did? It just equated. And, and Gail Ripplinger, um, she talks, she was an English teacher. And she talks in one of her books that I read, probably New Age Bible versions, when she was teaching in school, that, that uh, some of her students were asking about this and saying, ah, this is confusing to them. Yeah, it was confusing. She looked at that and said, yeah, it's confusing. And that's when she began her study, apparently, of that topic. So that just made Jesus and Satan gave him the same title. Luke 4.4. 4. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The NIV, Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The NIV leaves you a little hungry there, doesn't it? <laughs> At least it does me. Because Satan doesn't want you to get the full counsel. 1 Peter 2.2 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. NIV, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that, it, so that by it ye may grow up in your salvation. It doesn't define it. Another attack on the Bible. The NIV, I don't know what pure spiritual milk is, but I know what the sincere milk of the word is. Spiritual milk, there's people going on the internet and thinking they're getting spiritual milk and not the Word of God all the time. The blood. Colossians 1.14 In whom we have redemption, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. But the NIV says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Where's the blood of Christ? The importance of the blood of Christ is missing in the NIV that we're saved through his blood, even though that's the only way of redemption. I'll give you a couple of verses in rapid succession here without reading them. The blood of Christ is our redemption, Colossians 1.14, right here. In other verses, it is God's blood, Acts 20.28. 20, it was shed for you and me, Luke 22.20. 20. We are justified by his blood, Romans 5.9. We are made nigh unto God by his blood, Ephesians 2.13. His blood, it's his blood which makes our peace with God, Colossians 1.20. It is the only blood that can take away the sins of the world, 
Um, Hebrews 10.4. His blood cleanses us from all sins. 1 John 1.7. By his blood we have bold access to God, Hebrews 10.19. His blood sanctifies us, Hebrews 13.12. God calls his blood precious, 1 Peter 1.19. It is his blood that bears witness in the earth with his spirit and the water, in 1 John 5.8. And we are washed clean in the blood of the Lamb, Revelation 1.5. That's important doctrine in the scripture. NIV didn't quite think so. Teaching about hell, 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. The NIV. The wicked shall return to the grave, all the nations that forget God. I thought the wicked and the righteous were going into the grave. I mean, if I died tonight, I know where my body would go, it'd go into the grave. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the... So you see the confusion in the NIV? No, everybody goes into the grave, but the wicked are turned into hell. Missed in an NIV. Who's in the fire with you? Daniel 3.25. King James. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. But the NIV says, He said, Look. You can almost hear, Hey, look. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Who in the world is that? Yeah, Genesis 6. (laughs) Yeah. Was it not the Lord who said he'd never leave us nor forsake us? When you go through the fire and trials of this life, you want the son of God, not like a son of the gods with you. The King James and the New King James little different animal, this new King James. But, when compared to the King James, it omits the word Lord 66 times. It omits the word God 51 times. It omits the word heaven 50 times. Omits the word repent 44 times. Omits the word blood 23 times. Omits the word hell 22 times. Omits the word Jehovah Oh, completely. Omits the word New Testament, completely. Omits the word damnation, completely. Omits the word devils, completely. So they're not the same. Matthew 21, 32. The King James says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards that ye might believe him. The new King James, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Now, the Bible says clearly in other texts, that God would have men everywhere to repent, not relent. The Bible also says that it is godly sorrow that worketh repentance, not relentance unto salvation. God wants people to repent and to turn toward him, not relent and give up. Confusion over the doctrine of hell. So the King James is on the left, New King James on the right. King James in Matthew 16, 18, I think, yeah, 16, 18. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The King James says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, Where is thy sting, O grave? Where is thy victory? Now, let's just compare what the New King James says. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So they've used the word Hades instead of hell. Now, if you look at the next one, lower right-hand corner, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, 
where is your victory? So here what you have is you've got the new King James equating the grave to this place called Hades. But in what the King James is talking about hell, damnation, <laughs> and in the other case, in the other case is talking about the grave, which again where it's is where everybody goes. By the way, does anyone know what Hades actually is? The ancient Greek underworld. That's what Hades is. It's the abode of Hades, a mythological Greek god and brother of Zeus. The Assyrian Hades is an abode of blessedness with silver skies called happy fields. That's what Hades is to the Assyrians. In the New Age movement, this is key. Because this is what's going around now. This New Age stuff has been going around for decades and it's just so prevalent. In the New Age movement, Hades is an intermediate state of purification. I go to Hades to get purified as I'm working my way to the God of forces. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. Now, maybe you've seen this. I don't know that it's still on the, the New King James Bible, but I want to point it out anyway. I haven't looked at a New King James Bible in a while. But years ago I would watch, not that many years ago, Jack Van Impey on TV. And he had a New King James Bible. Even though the man had spent a lifetime memorizing the King James Bible, but whatever. And, and he used to have that New King James Bible sitting there. And on the cover of that was this right here. It's supposed to represent, they say, the Trinity. Okay, never-ending lines. Now, there it is again. But look on the right-hand side. That was on the cover of a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy. And it was written by a woman named Marilyn Ferguson. It was written as a defense of New Ageism and the way the world was moving. And she was in favor of this. And I got to admit, it was, I, I bought that thing. I tried to read it. It was a boring stinker of a book. I couldn't even read it. But that's beside the point. But so on the cover of a King, New King James Bible and on a cover of, of uh, Aquarian Conspiracy. This is written by an author by the name of Constance Cumby. She wrote years ago, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow. And a notable authority on the New Age movement. And she wrote, quote, on the cover of the Aquarian Conspiracy is a Mobius. It is really used by them as a triple six Six, six. That's how they use it. If you can see it. Six, six, six. That's what the New Age people think of it. The emblem on the cover of the New King James Bible is said to be an ancient symbol of the Trinity. The old, she writes, the old symbol had Gnostic origins. It was more Gnostic than Christian. I was rather alarmed, she writes, when I noticed the emblem. This is when she was talking on uh, Southwest Radio Church in 1982 uh, on, the King, on the New Age movement. The New King James Bible supports the New Age movement. Brother Joe and I were talking a little bit about that earlier. I think that's what we are talking about. I was talking to somebody about it. <laughs> There's that memory thing again. Anyway, let's take a look at this. So here, what we're going to see here in a moment is how the New King James supports the New Age concept of a universal false, but a universal savior, which we will know will be the Antichrist or the false Christ. So here's what I mean. This has got a pointer, yep. There's the New King James. Here's the King James. Here's the references on the right or left. Um, Luke 7, 19 to 20. Start at the King James over here on the right. He that should come. The New King James says, or, yeah, the coming one, capitalized, the coming one. Just keep that in mind. Matthew 11, 3, King James says, he that should come. The New King James says, the coming one, capitalized. John 7, 18, the King James says in that verse, he and his. The New King James says, the one, capitalized. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 the King James says, person, 
the New King James says, presence. So what it's doing here, it is coming up with, in the New King James, it's coming up with these terms that are more nebulous, they are, are more new agey. I'll show you here in a moment. So just keep that in mind, the coming one. Luke 7.19, which is what I was talking about back here. It was the first one up there on the upper left hand. So now here's the verse. King James says, And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And John, call, New King James says, And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent him, them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, capitalized, or do we look for another? The coming one is a New Age concept. The phrase, the coming one, is used by all New Agers, many of them, I'll say, many, all around the world to invoke the one that they see coming, their Christ, the coming one. From the great invocation from 1940 to the year you know, 2000 plus, this great invocation of the New Ages says this, from the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May the coming one return to earth. That's a phrase used in New Age philosophy, the coming one. You see the argument being built in a new King James? You don't see that in the King James. Now I'm not saying you won't see the one capitalized in the King James Bible somewhere. I think you do. But the point is it's laying down line upon line to give you a different doctrine. Many religions believe that a world teacher, a coming one, will return to earth. Knowing this coming one by such names as Christ, the Lord Maitreya, the Imam Mahdi, and the Messiah. The original version of the great invocation, including the line, may Christ return to earth at the conclusion of the second stanza, but added a statement to say that other faith versions of the great invocation referred to the coming one by the name most commonly used in their own religion. The revised version affirms the interfaith spirit, I'm sorry, revised version, the, the, um, uh, the New King James version, affirms the interfaith spirit of this prayer in the invocation, may the coming one return to earth, adding a note that some of the Christian, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, and Jewish versions of the great invocation use the name Christ or Lord Maitreya. So they just change it as they want, but it's the coming one. Again, kind of subtle, but it's there. Getting close to the end here. Acts 17, 29. For as much then as uh, King James, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead, notice, it's a specific thing, the Godhead, that's the Trinity, is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's devices, the New King James says, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. This is an old trick by an old adversary. In 1729 of Acts, in King James, the very definite Godhead, Trinity, becomes the nebulous or less clear divine nature, which again is a New Age concept which goes all the way to Christ not being God, but rather possessing a certain amount of Godness, a certain amount of Christ-likeness, a certain amount of the divine nature. And oh, by the way, Satan says you can possess that divine nature too. You see the problem? The Godhead, definite thing, becomes this thing, the divine nature. I like this one. Confusion over salvation. King James says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The new King James says, Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now on the first hand you might think, well, okay, it sounds about right. No. No. It's narrow it's exclusive in that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
And the road to destruction is wide, narrow, exclusive through Christ, instead of wide. It's not difficult. Otherwise, why do you have VBS? If it's difficult. Did not the Lord say, Suffer the little children to come unto me? For as such is the kingdom of God. Yeah, it's not difficult. It's narrow, just like the Bible says. One God of this age. Science. That's one of many gods of this age. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely called, so called, becomes knowledge in the New King James. Again, not the same. Science is one of the gods of this age. Science is always telling us this or that, the science of, of evolution, the science of climate change. All these scientists, they're the gods of the humanists and of this world, the scientists. In an old-fashioned, out-of-date 1611 Bible, God nailed it in English. Yeah, sure did. Science, falsely so-called. New King James, not so clear. At the top is the King James, the bottom is the New King James. Deuteronomy 23:17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Now we know from common language once upon a time is that sodomite is a homosexual. Sodom and Gomorrah, sin of homosexuality. Over to the right, and there were also, 1 Kings 14.24, sodomites in the land. Okay, so consistent, sodomites. The New King James, Deuteronomy 23.17 says, There shall no ritual harlot of the daughters of Israel or a perverted one of the sons of Israel. And 1 Kings 14.24 says, And there were also perverted persons in the land. Now I will grant you that the sin of homosexuality, sodomites, is perversion. But just saying perversion without context doesn't tell me what it's talking about. It leaves it unclear. So it fits along very nicely with the, lane, with the day and age in which you and I live. Where now it's just an alternative lifestyle. Yep, it justifies it. Just a couple more slides. King James. Casting down imaginations. The New King James says, casting down arguments. Imaginations and arguments are not the same thing. God makes it clear in the King James Bible that man has a problem with his imagination. That's the problem we had. And if you begin to cross-reference imagination and imagine in a King James Bible going all the way back to Genesis before the flood, you'll see how the King James Bible preserves the ability to do that kind of cross-referencing and to understand what the problem is with man's imagination. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God wants you to get it. For we are not as many, King James says, which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. In the sight of God speak we in Christ. The new King James says, For we are not as so many peddling the word of God. That's just not the same. I guess the scholars couldn't get themselves to translate the word corrupt. But it's not the same. To peddle and to corrupt are not the same thing. Again, they're different. New King James. Let me summarize. And we're done. Things that are different are not the same. I didn't originate that saying, but it's true. But what we've looked at so far is just the tip of the iceberg. Next week, Lord willing, we'll dig into some of the manuscript evidence and get to the root of this issue. And then we'll also look at some of the internal evidence that God has placed in his precious word. And we'll look at, if you will, the fruit of the evidence. So now what? What do I do? I got a little bit of knowledge. You got the knowledge from Pastor Seth the last few weeks and, and now tonight and then, and then next week, Lord willing. What do you do? Well, rejoice in what the Lord's given to you. Rejoice in it. Be confident 
in the knowledge and understanding that God has preserved his word. Don't let somebody steal your Bible from you. Now, I'm not personally going to... People are different. I'm not going to separate from somebody who reads an NIV Bible. They're brother in the Lord, they're brother in the Lord, sister in the Lord, sister in the Lord. But I'm not going to let them steal my Bible from me either. Don't, I would suggest, be argumentative about it. But don't be fooled by so-called scholarship that says we got a better rendering. And get out and win souls for Christ with his book, The Sharpest Sword, the King James Bible. And I think we're done, brother. Thanks for coming tonight. Uh, let's just close with prayer for a second. Lord God, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy in our lives. Thank you for uh, the word that you've given to us. Lord, I just pray that uh, you would help each one of us to take something in, mull it around, and Lord, I just pray that you give us better understanding and uh, just joy in knowing that thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for giving us your word and we thank you in Jesus, our precious Savior's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.